the magic little pencil. Noah got off his school bus and stepped out on the street in the little town in which he lived. He never imagined that this would be the weirdest day of his life. He was walking on a crosswalk when he saw an old man shivering from the cold and looking very hungry and begging politely for food. P -p Please help me. I haven't eaten in two days. Can you spare a little something to eat? Noah felt pity for the old man. So he went to a nearby shop and bought food, as well as a bottle of water for him. He gave the shopkeeper the money which he had been saving up to buy a new pencil box for himself. It wasn't long before he was walking up to the old man. Here, this is for you. Oh, thank you, dear boy. I thought I was going to starve to death. That is so kind of you. After eating the food and drinking some of the water that Noah had kindly brought him, he began to feel better and turned a proud gaze upon Noah. I've been searching for a kind-hearted person for a very long time. I do believe that my search ends today. Noah was confused when he heard this, so he asked the old man politely. What do you mean? The old man reached into the satchel he was carrying and pulled out an antique box. He looked solemn and reverent as he slowly opened it to reveal its contents. Inside rested a very old pencil, which was shining as a bright little star. Noah was astonished by this sight. Suddenly, the old man abruptly closed the rusty lid, handing it to Noah, and says to him, Noah, yes, I know your name, for I am a wizard. I have been on a very long quest, seeking out a boy such as yourself, who would be willing to put aside their own desires in order to help others. Now, you can help others with this magic pencil. Just draw whatever you wish, and it will appear in before you instantly. Oh, wow! Thank you, kind wizard! Now I can help people in need whenever I want. This is great! Thank you so much! Just remember these two things. Don't tell this secret to anyone, or else they may steal it from you. And secondly, if you need my help at any time, you can just draw a picture of me, and I will be there in an instant. Don't worry, wizard! I will remember your instructions! Suddenly, in the blink of an eye, the wizard disappeared, and Noah excitedly continued his journey home. Noah couldn't wait to try out his magic pencil. So he draws a cake, and presto, it was instantly in front of him, sitting on a silver platter. The next day, he started to help each and every person he could find that needed something or other. He was walking down the road when he saw an overworked bellhop from a local hotel trying unsuccessfully to carry an overabundance of heavy and awkwardly shaped luggage. So, to help the young man out, Noah draws a baggage cart for him in order to ease his heavy burden. Then he saw a little girl who was barefoot and trying to sell matches and no one seemed to care. But Noah did, and he proceeded to draw a basket of food along with some cozy slippers for her. After a while, he saw some homeless people shivering on the cold, hard street. So he drew some small but beautiful houses for them to call homes of their very own. That's how Noah chose to help the people around him. One day, when he was helping a poor man, the greedy and selfish mayor saw the kind and helpful boy. 
The mayor also saw how the little boy Noah was able to make all these things appear out of thin air with a simple yet magical pencil. The next day, the mayor ordered some policemen to arrest the boy for the illegal use of magic towards the unfortunate, because the law that the mayor had made only allowed the use of magic for the wealthy people of the land. The police found Noah using his magic pencil for all to see, magically helping those less fortunate than himself, and arrested him on the spot and dragged him off to present him to the mayor. He said, Noah, I saw how you helped those sick, hungry, hopeless, homeless, and poor people. Now you must help me. Draw me what I want. A tree that produces fruit of solid gold. Sir, with all due respect, I only help poor and needy people, and you're neither poor nor needy. It's not a request, Noah. I am ordering you to do so. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I will not do this. Then be prepared for a severe punishment, you stupid boy. The mayor then demanded his servants to snatch the magic pencil from Noah. One policeman successfully did so and gave it to the mayor. Now, the mayor began to draw a tree with golden fruit. It was a nice picture, full of colorful detail, but the magic within the pencil didn't respond to him. He then handed the writing utensil over to the policeman, who also tried, but failed as well, to conjure up anything from his stick drawing of a horse, which he had scribbled on a fresh sheet of paper. The policeman commented to the mayor, I think the pencil won't take any orders from us, sir. It only recognizes Noah's hand, so only the boy can fulfill your wish, Mayor. The greedy mayor was furious. Noah, I'm asking you for the last time. Are you going to draw me golden fruit tree or not? Choose your words wisely, they may be your last. Noah was a brave boy, but at this point, he only wanted to end this whole fiasco. So, he said he would draw something, and the mayor handed the boy the magic pencil. The next thing Noah draws is the picture of an old man on the piece of paper, and the wizard, who had given the clever and kind boy the magic pencil, came to rescue Noah. As soon as he appeared, the old man turned those policemen into cats, and he said, don't you dare try to misuse the magic of this pencil for your own greedy endeavors, Mr. Mayor. Otherwise, you will be the next one who will lick his own tail. The mayor was greatly frightened and shivered with fear. Then, the old man admonished the mayor not to be so greedy and selfish. The mayor also acknowledged his wrongs and apologized to Noah and the wizard. The very next day, the mayor rewarded Noah for his kind deeds and acts of helpfulness for the whole townspeople to see. And Noah continued to help those less fortunate and lived happily ever after. The End The Magic Ring a wealthy father gave his son 300 gold coins and sent him off to journey the world in search of finding a trade for his unique skills. Robin, for that was the son's name, took the money and said farewell to his father. He had not gotten very far when he came across some herdsmen quarreling over a dog that some of them wished to kill. Please do not kill the dog. I will give you 100 gold coins for it pleaded the young fellow. Then and there, the bargain was struck, and the foolish young man took the dog and continued on his way. It was not long after that he met up with some folks fighting about a cat. Some of them wanted to kill it, but others did not. Oh, please do not kill it. I will give you 100 gold coins for it. Of course, they at once gave him the cat and took the money, 
He went on till he reached a village, where some folk were quarreling over a snake that had just been caught. Some of them wished to kill it, but others did not. Please do not kill the snake. I will give you one hundred gold coins for it. Of course, the people agreed, and were highly delighted. Upon becoming the proud new owner of a snake, a dog, and cat, Robin went home. You fool! You scamp! Exclaimed his father when he had heard how his son had wasted all the money that had been given to him. Go and live in the stables and repent of your folly. You shall never again enter my house. So the young man went and lived in the stables. His companions were the dog, the cat, and the snake. These creatures grew very fond of him. One day, the snake, in course of conversation, said to its master. I am the son of King Basilisk. One day, when I had come out of the ground to drink the air, some people seized me and would have killed me had you not most opportunely arrived at my rescue. How glad my father would be to see his son be rescued. Where does he live? I should like to see him if possible. Well said. Do you see Mount Olympus? At the bottom of that mountain there is a sacred spring well. If you come with me and dive into that spring, we shall both reach my father's country. Oh, he will wish to reward you too. However, if he asks what you would like, you would reply, The ring on your right hand and the famous pot and spoon which you possess. With these in your possession, you would never need anything, for the ring is magical. You would have to speak to it, and immediately a beautifully furnished mansion will be provided for you. And the pot and the spoon will supply you with all manner of the rarest and most delicious foods. Attended by his three critter companions, the man walked to the well and prepared to jump in, according to the snake's directions. He ordered his dog and cat to stay behind and protect the entrance. The young man and the snake reached their destination in safety, and information of their arrival was sent to the King Basilisk. Then the king went and embraced his son, and saluting the stranger, welcomed him to his dominions. Welcome to the land of serpents, young man. You saved my son's life, and I am so much thankful for that. Now your wish is my command. Please ask anything, and I will provide that to you in an instant. Thank you, King Basilisk, but I do not want anything in exchange. It is a wise man's duty to save the poor soul if he saw one in trouble. You are not only kind, but gentlemanly also. It is my request. You should stay here for several days. The young man stayed there for a few days, during which he received the king's right-hand ring and the pot and spoon, in recognition of His Highness's gratitude to him for having delivered his son. He then returned. On reaching the top of the spring, he found his friends, the dog and the cat, waiting for him. Afterward, they walked together to the riverside, where it was decided to try the powers of the charmed ring and pot and spoon. The merchant's son spoke to the ring, and immediately a beautiful house and a lovely princess with golden hair appeared. He soon got married to the princess. They all together established their own kingdom, where people were never hungry because of the magical pot and spoon. Time and again he used his magical ring and helped others in his kingdom, and they lived very happily ever after. With only 300 gold coins, which he spends to save his friend's life, he gets tons of happiness and wealth in return. So kids, the moral of this story is good deeds always pay handsomely. The End The Magic Bell Once upon a time, in a small village, lived a poor boy named Pooh. He lived with his mother and younger brother. Pooh lived in a small hut which stood right in the center of the village. To earn a livelihood for his family, he used to graze cattle with some of his friends near the mountains, and in the evening 
returned them to their respective owners. Every day, while the cattle went for grazing, he loved to sit under a tree and play melodious tunes on his wooden flute. Hey Pooh, why do you always play your flute at this very spot? I don't know. I love this tree, and you may think I'm crazy, but I feel like this tree is alive and listens to my music. Oh, you're right. What? You think so, too? No! I meant you're right that I think you're crazy. <laughs> but Pooh was right. The tree did listen to his music. The music had touched the tree's spirit. It would listen to the tune intently and be happy to have Pooh play it every day. One day, as Pooh was slumbering on one of the branches of the tree, there was a terrible noise beneath him. Ah, oh, what's, what's that? Oh, earthquake, earthquake! There was a woodcutter cutting the same tree where Pooh was sleeping. Who is this man? Phew, this'll take some time. Pooh soon understood what was going on and quickly climbs downward. Hey, what are you doing? Why are you cutting this tree? My master would like to use it for his boat. This tree is very strong. No, you can't cut it. Really? And why is that? Listen, I've spent many days trying to find strong support for the boat. And you don't own this tree, so don't waste my time. Pooh will soon have to do something to save the tree, or it will be too late. So he used his cleverness to try and scare the woodcutter away. He said, Well, you can't say I didn't warn you. It's bound to happen, I suppose. What's that supposed to mean? Well, don't you know? A spirit of an old witch lives in this tree. She's been staying here for years. If you cut this tree down, she'll latch herself onto you, of course. Latch? Latch onto me? Why? Isn't it obvious? Since you're the one cutting down this tree? Are you trying to fool me? I'm smarter than you think, boy. I'm not going to fall for this story. Go away now. Who was desperate to save this tree. As soon as the woodcutter got busy, Pooh climbed up and went straight to the top. He hid in the dense leaves and began to scream. Ah! Ha ha ha! How dare you touch my home! What? Who is that? If you destroy my home, I will come to live with you, and I will never leave you, human. The boy was right. Don't worry, human. We will be good friends. <laughs> the woodcutter began to run as fast as he could. What's the hurry, my friend? Just as Pooh was laughing at the woodcutter, the tree came to life. Pooh. Pooh was shocked to hear someone talking to him. Are, are you really the spirit of an old witch? <laughs> no, Pooh. I am not an old witch spirit. I mean, I am old, but I am the spirit of this tree. Your music brought me to life. You are a cunning boy, Pooh, and I am grateful to you. You saved me from the woodcut. Suddenly, a nice golden bell appeared in front of Pooh, which was floating in mid-air. Here, accept this as a thank you gift. A bell? Not just an ordinary bell, my dear. This is a magical bell. Every time you ring it, the plate will magically fill with delicious food to eat. Oh, wow! This will really help me and my family! Yes, it, it will, but remember, Pooh, you can only ring this bell once in a day. I will remember that! Thank you, dear tree! Pooh ran to call his mother and brother in the village. Mom! Ronnie! Come here and look what I've got! He shared the incident with them, 
They were very happy to see the magic bell. They wished for their favorite foods, rang the bell, and ate to their heart's content. Afterwards, they went to bed with their tummies full after a long and delicious meal. The next morning, as usual, Pooh took the cattle out to graze on the pasture, leaving the bell at home. When he came back in the evening, tired and hungry, he found all the pots empty. There was no food left for him to eat. Pooh was saddened and just ate the leftovers that he found in a cupboard. Still being hungry after his meager meal, he went to bed. He couldn't sleep due to his tummy growling of hunger. So he decided to take the magic bell with him the next day. When his mother and younger brother were hungry later that day, they looked for the bell. They searched the entire hut from top to bottom, but couldn't find the magic bell, which made them very sad. They thought that they had lost the bell. They had neither the bell nor food. They went to bed on empty stomachs. When Pooh returned home in the evening, he took out the magic bell from his satchel. He ordered his most favorite food. His mother and younger brother were very sad to see this. His younger brother started crying, and he said, Brother, we're so hungry, and we kept looking for the bell. You have become so selfish. How could you? Hearing this, Pooh realized his mistake. He regretted his decision, but he also shared with his honest thoughts. You asked the bell to give you food, but you forgot to save some for me. I was tired and went to bed hungry and it hurt my feelings, so I was sad and angry. His brother and mother also realized their mistakes. They ate their meal together as a family that night. And from that day onwards, they never slept with empty stomachs and lived happily ever after. The End The Happy Prince High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded from head to toe with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. One night, a little swallow flew over the city. She was tired and wished to spend the night between the feet of the happy prince. As she was just about to fall asleep, a large drop of water fell on her. She was curious as there were no clouds in the sky. Then another drop of water fell on her. The swallow decided to look for another place to sleep. Just then, a third drop fell. She looked up and saw that these were the tears from the eyes of the happy prince. The swallow, filled with compassion, asked, Who are you, and why are you crying? I used to be a human and lived in a grand palace. While I was kind, humble of heart, there was no sorrow within my kingdom, and my courtiers called me the happy prince. After my death, I had been set up on a high pillar. My heart is made of lead, and yet it always weeps when I see the ugliness and the misery of my city now. You poor thing! So, why are you crying now? Far away in a little cottage, the little boy of a seamstress is sick. He's crying because his mother could not give him anything to eat because she is very poor. And all she has to offer the small lad is water from a nearby river. But the little one's stomach craves food. Then how can you help them from here? Take the ruby from my sword hilt and give it to the poor woman. The little swallow obeyed the prince and then 
flew to the seamstress's cottage and laid the ruby on her table. She also fluttered over the poor sick boy to give him relief from his fever. As she flew away, the poor mother awoke to find the sparkling ruby resting by her hand. Both of them felt truly happy. When the swallow returned, the prince said, I can see a writer. He is suffering from the cold and is apparently very hungry. Still, he is writing the story because he will not get anything if he leaves his book unfinished. Dear Swallow, will you please give him the sapphire gem from one of my eyes? No, my prince, I cannot do that. It is my order, dear Swallow. The Swallow did not want to pluck out the sapphire from his eye, but she obeyed the generous prince reluctantly. So the Swallow once again flew into the life of another unfortunate soul, even if it was only for a moment and laid the sapphire upon the writer's desk. She saw that the writer had fallen unconscious due to the cold and suffering from hunger. So she gathered some wood and lit a fire within the man's fireplace. As she flew away from there, the writer felt the warmth of the blaze and slowly awoke. He saw the sparkling sapphire on his desk and with immense joy and gratitude, thanked God for providing it. Upon the return of the tiny swallow, the prince said, I have seen a little match girl whose wares have fallen into the gutter. She is very afraid and quivers with fear, knowing that her father would beat her hard if she returned home empty-handed. You have nothing left on you to give her, sire. Dear Swallow, I still have my other eye left. Please give it to that little match girl. Never, my prince. I cannot do that. For then you would be blind if I took the other sapphire from you. I beg of you, dear Swallow. It is the last time I can help someone. After this quest, I will bother you no more. And you can leave me be and continue on your journey. At his command, the swallow very unwillingly plucked out the sapphire of the other eye of the happy prince, who now was totally blind. The swallow made her final mission for the self-sacrificing statue and silently slipped the sapphire into the palm of the young match girl and returned to the prince, saying, I am not going anywhere, my prince. I will stay here with you till my last breath. From this day forth, I shall be your eyes. Now, the swallow reported daily to the now meager-looking statue of the sufferings of the people. At the command of the happy prince, the swallow took off the golden leaves from the statue and distributed them among the poor people to give them wealth so they could each afford a better life. Now, the statue was dull and gray, as there was no gold left on him. Soon, winter came, and the frost made the swallow colder and colder, so cold that she was about to die. She flew to the happy prince and kissed him on his forehead. This is the final farewell that I shall bid you, my prince. Oh, you have finally decided to continue your journey, my little friend. I am happy for you. Farewell, my little friend. Farewell. No, prince. I am journeying to my death. My death is certain, as I decided to stay with you that day. But I have no regrets about it, for I am at peace and content. The swallow fluttered haphazardly downward to die at the feet of the statue that she had come to admire and love. The prince cried for an immeasurable length of time, and the lead heart which beat within his now gray form broke in two. The mayor ordered that the statue should be pulled down because it was neither beautiful nor useful. But the broken heart 
did not melt in the furnace. So it was thrown away and came to rest on top of a trash heap where the poor swallow lay dead. Upon seeing this, God determined to put his angels that he had created to a test. So he said to them, Bring me the two most precious things upon the earth that I have created. Yes, Lord. The heavenly beings came upon the same dust heap where the dead swallow and the happy prince's heart now resided, a lowly trash heap. And the angels picked them up instantly. O oh, Father of the heavenly lights, these are the two most precious things we found upon your earth. God praised the angel's choice in bringing him the lead heart of the happy prince and the deceased swallow. Now the swallow will stay here in my garden, and the prince will also stay here and enjoy the beauties of my heaven. Now, whenever swallow and the happy prince see suffering upon the earth, their teardrops fall from the sky and rain breaks forth from the clouds. The End The Magic Porridge Pot Once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl named Melody. She lived with her mother in a small cottage. They were very, very poor, but Melody tried to make her mother happy by singing songs to her. Every day, Melody used to go into the woods to find something to eat. She used to bring back whatever she could find, but their bellies were never full. One day, saddened with their poverty, Melody left the house and went into the woods looking for something to eat. No matter how hard she searched, there was nothing to be found. Finally, Melody could bear it no more. She sat on a rock and started to cry. While crying, she sang a sad song in her sweet, melodious voice. Hearing her voice, a forest fairy appeared in front of her and said, What happened, my child? Why are you crying? And what are you doing alone in the woods? I am here to find something to eat for me and my mother. We are very poor and very hungry, said Melody with grief on her face. Don't worry, the fairy said, and with her magical wand, she changed a pebble into a big magical pot. Melody was amazed to see the magic. Take this pot home, and your family shall never be hungry again. I don't want to be rude, but what good is an empty pot if there's no food in it to cook? Melody said in a disheartening voice, to which the fairy answered, This is a magical pot. When you want something to eat, say, Cook, pot, cook. And when it's ready, say, stop, pot, stop. <sighs> Melody was delighted with the gift she got from the fairy. And, with due respect, she asked the fairy, Oh, dear fairy godmother, I don't have enough words to thank you. Please, tell me what I can do for you in return. I don't want anything in return, but if you want, you can sing me a beautiful song every day. Before Melody could ask any more questions, the forest fairy disappeared. When Melody arrived home with nothing but an empty pot, her mother was very unhappy and said, what use is the pot if you have nothing to cook in it? Melody lifted the pot to the table and simply said, Cook, pot, cook! 
nothing happened. Melody looked worried, but then the pot started to shake and hissed. The steam rose and up bubbled the creamiest porridge they had ever seen. Melody's mother understood that the pot was magical. She was so hungry <laughs> that she could mm. not resist the creamy mm. porridge, oh, it's and delicious. she licked it with her finger. She was overwhelmed with the taste of the porridge so much that she did not pay attention to Melody's other command. Stop, pot, stop! They ate and ate until the pot was empty and their stomachs were full. Melody's mother rubbed her stomach happily. Melody then thought, Oh, it's time for me to go and sing a song for the forest fairy. So she left the house and went into the woods again. Here at home, <laughs> her mother was so happy Ta -ta. that they would never have to worry about the food again. She collected all the old pots in which she used to cook <laughs> and threw them away bye bye. to make space See for you the new later. one. Or not. She polished and patted the new pot. All this hard work made her hungry again. Cook, pot, cook, she commanded. And presto, from inside the pot, more delicious <laughs> porridge bubbled up. Not even bothering to get the bowl, she ate directly from the pot. Mmm, delicious! But as quickly as she ate, the pot kept filling up until it was set to bubble up right over the edge. Oh dear, how did Melody make the pot stop? Enough pot, enough! But the pot bubbled on. It's plenty, Pot. It's plenty. The porridge steamed over the edge onto the table. Really, that will do. The porridge pours over the floor. Melody's mother starts to panic. Cease! Uh, finish! No more! She commanded. Soon, she realized that she had made a great mistake and ran away. The porridge poured out from the doors and windows onto the streets, bubbling and forming a great wave and rolled through the village. People gathered up on their rooftops and started to call for help. Melody heard the villagers calling out in distress. She raced down the woods towards the village. She took a wooden plank and a stick and rode towards her house. When she reached just outside her house, she shouted, Stop, pot, stop! And that is just what the pot did. As the bubbling subsided, Melody saw that all the villagers were reaching down and lifting a handful of creamy porridge to their mouth. The whole village enjoyed the porridge. They ate and ate and ate the whole winter long. And no one in the village was hungry ever again. The End Wizard of Oz Many years ago, in a place called Lawrence, there lived a little girl whose name was Dorothy. She lived with her Aunt Em and Uncle Henry on their farm. She had a dog named Toto. One day, she noticed strange weather. The clouds were dense and thundering loud. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky, too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes when she heard a loud wail of the wind, and she ran towards the door to see if the storm was about to come. Suddenly, Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and ran towards the cyclone, and she, too, ran behind to catch him. After a while, finally, 
Toto hid under the hot-aired balloon, which halts beyond the farm. There, she met a very interesting person. He was called Professor Marvel, and that big hot-aired balloon was owned by him. He greets Dorothy with his magical words. Sim, Sim, Salabim, if my words are worthy, you are the little girl Dorothy. Dorothy was curious to know how he knew her name. But suddenly, she saw a big twister coming towards them. So she picked Toto and ran towards Cellar as fast as she could. When she got back, it was too late. She ran into the house, but when the twister came, she fell and hit her head. The wind lifted the whole house with Dorothy and Toto inside it, high up in the air. After some time, the house landed down on the ground. Dorothy steps out and finds that she was in a very different place. The place was much more colorful and beautiful than Lawrence. Soon Glinda, the kind witch of the North, appeared and welcomed her. Welcome, Dorothy, to the Land of Oz. I am the witch from the North. Oh, my, my, I came here? As I remember, there was a tornado and then, then... And then you came here, my dear Dorothy. That tornado was the portal to enter in the Land of Oz. And I am so grateful to you for having killed the Wicked Witch of the East. You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway. And that is the same thing. See? Glinda pointing out to the corner of the house. There are her two feet still sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy could hardly believe and cried out of fright. The sister of the Wicked Witch also saw what all happened, and soon she too reached the site. She was flying above on her broomstick and was very angry with Dorothy for killing her sister. You little rat! How dare you kill my sister? Even you dare to wear my sister's ruby slippers, which belong to me now. I will not spare you. Dorothy had no idea how the ruby slippers came to be on her own feet. But they wouldn't come off, as she tried several times to remove them. And then suddenly, Wicked Witch of West cast a spell on Dorothy. But it overturns on herself and she gets caught on fire. Cursing her, she said, You little rat, soon I will come back and show you my fury. The witch flew away saying this, and now Dorothy had made a sworn enemy. Dorothy got scared and said, Glinda, what do I do now? She will definitely come back for me. <laughs> oh dear. Don't worry. Now, you go back to Lawrence as early as possible. But I don't know how to get back home. You must go to the Emerald City. The Great Wizard of Oz lives there. Ask him to help you. How do I get to the Emerald City? Is it a long way? Will you come with me? You must follow the Yellow Brick Road. It is a long way. And those ruby slippers will protect you. No one will hurt you until you wear those slippers. Soon, Dorothy and Toto found the yellow brick road, and they walked along with it. After walking for several miles, Dorothy sat down to rest. There was a big cornfield by the side of the road. In the middle of the field was a scarecrow. It was fixed onto a pole. Dorothy looked at the scarecrow and smiled. We have scarecrows in Lawrence, too. That's right! Dorothy looked at the Scarecrow in surprise. But our Scarecrows and Lawrence don't talk. I don't talk much. The crows are not scared of me. They have brains, and I don't. Oh dear, perhaps I can help you. She stood up and lifted the Scarecrow down from the pole. Oh, that's better. I can move my legs now. What's your name? Where are you going? My name is Dorothy. I'm going to the Emerald City to see the Great Wizard of Oz. 
I have heard only he can get me back to my home in Lawrence. Um, never heard that name before, but then I don't have any brain to remember. Do you think that Oz would give me some brains? Why don't you come with me and ask him? Thank you. Indeed, it is a good idea. So they set off together. A little further, they came upon a man made of tin. Where are you going? We are going to the Emerald City to see the Great Oz, in the hope that he will give us what we want. Oh, I have no heart. Could Oz give me a heart? Why don't you come with us and find out? Thank you. I surely will join you. So they all left, following the yellow brick road. The road was passing through a dense forest. The forest was getting darker and spookier. Woof! Woof! Looking at the moving bush, Toto started to bark at it. And all of a sudden, a big muscular lion appeared from behind the bush. They all were scared and shivering. But she was surprised to see that the lion burst into tears and was crying loud. Hey! First you came from nowhere and scared us, and now you are crying? <laughs> what a strange lion you are! <laughs> I am a coward, and I'm afraid of everything. When I roar, my heart beats very fast because I have no courage. At least you have a heart. And you have brains, too. Toto and I want to go home to Lawrence. I am going to ask Oz to help us get back there. Do you think that Oz can give me courage? Then I wouldn't be a coward anymore. It seems that the wizard is very powerful. You are welcome to come with us and ask him. They all reached the Emerald City. It was a wonderful place where everything was green. The wizard was known to everyone in the city, but no one had seen him personally. They all reached a castle. The castle dome was similar to the hot air balloon that she saw during the storm. Wondering, when she tried to enter the gates, she was stopped by the royal guards. You are entering the Emerald City Castle. How may I help you? We have come to see the Great Wizard of Oz. We've come such a long way, not to waste his time. Then I will ask permission to the wizard. You should all wait here. Eventually, the wizard agreed to meet them. As soon as they entered in royal court, they saw a hologram image of his face on the throne. It was huge and appeared to be very frightening. Sim Sim Salabim. Hello, Dorothy, a child from Lawrence, which I knew. Tell me, dear, what can I do to please you? I know this voice, but from where? Oh, Wizard of Oz, we humbly ask you for your help. Oh, little Dorothy, I will help you, sure. Grab the Wicked Witch's broomstick, and I won't let you endure. Off they went, a little daunted by their task, towards the witch's castle. The Wicked Witch wanted Dorothy's ruby slippers because she knew they had great power. As soon as they reach the witch's castle, she greets them, saying, Hello again, you little rat. Finally, we meet again to your end. Now, give me those ruby slippers, or I will kill you. <laughs> no one will go anywhere from here, and I am going to kill you all. She had a plan of her own to destroy them, one by one. She shoots out the fire at them from her broomstick. Dorothy tries to protect herself from that fire. Her slippers glow, and a gush of water comes out of her hand. The fire fizzles off. The Wicked Witch gets angrier. As she raises her wand to cast a spell upon them, Toto runs and grabs her broomstick for Dorothy. The slippers glow again, and Dorothy shoots fire directly at the witch, burning and melting her in her own castle. Dorothy took the broomstick of the Wicked Witch to the wizard. On seeing that they have completed his task, the wizard reveals his true self to them. He was Professor Marvel. 
Professor Marvel agreed to take Dorothy back to her home in Lawrence. He issued a diploma to the Scarecrow, a bravery medal to the Lion, and a heart-shaped watch to the Tin Man. They all were happy. Glinda, too, appears in front of them. You have helped everyone in the Land of Oz. So, these ruby slippers belong to you now. You can now take them off any time you want. And if you need me any time in the future, just knock the shoes together three times and I will be there for you. Dorothy said goodbye to her friends. Professor Marvel, Dorothy, and Toto take off in the hot air balloon, waving them from above. Before she knew it, she was in her own bed in Lawrence. Aunt Em and Uncle Henry were trying to wake her up. Dorothy wakes up with the long yawn. She tries to tell them about the amazing adventures she's had, but to them, it was all just her dream. As she pulls her blanket off and notices the sparkling red ruby slippers beside her leg. The End Pinocchio Long, long ago, there lived an old toy maker named Geppetto. When he worked, Geppetto felt happy. When he took rest, a sad feeling came over him. Ah, uh, all my life and I have no child to call my own. One day, Geppetto carved a puppet from wood in the shape of a boy. While putting him in the cupboard, he said, I will call you Pinocchio. That night, from out of the window, a big star twinkled brightly. Geppetto looked out the window to the twinkling star and made an impossible wish. If I could make one wish, it would be that I would have a real boy of my own. That night, the same big star swooshed right into Geppetto's room. It changed into a blue fairy. The blue fairy flew over to the bed and said to sleeping Geppetto, Wise Geppetto, you gave everyone happiness by creating beautiful toys and clocks. Now it's my turn to fulfill your wish. Then she turned to Pinocchio and said, Little wood puppet, you will be able to walk and talk like a real boy. She tapped the puppet one time with her wand. And if you can prove that you are brave and true, someday you will be a real boy. Pinocchio's eyes opened, and with another spell of the fairy, a cricket appeared. Meet Mr. Jiminy Cricket. He will be your conscience. He will stay with you to help you make wise choices. And with that, the blue fairy went swoosh and was gone. When Geppetto woke up the next morning, he said, I will go take my Pinocchio out of the cupboard to finish up some final touches. But the cupboard was empty. Geppetto was worried, and he began to search the whole house. Suddenly, a voice came from the other side of the room. <laughs> Papa! Here I am, Papa! What? You can talk? Yep! I am Pinocchio, your boy! How can this be? He rushed over and swept the wooden puppet into his arms. Pinocchio, my son! He said in great happiness. One day, Pinocchio saw some boys going to school, and he said to Geppetto, I want to go to school like other boys. Later that day, Geppetto came back home with school books. Now you can go to school. The next morning, Pinocchio said goodbye to Geppetto. He skipped along the path to school, humming as he went. The cricket rode on his shoulder, happy too. Coming up to them on the path, was a greedy fox and a dumb cat. What a lovely boy you are. And where are you going on this fine day? I'm going to school. You should come with us to the fair. 
he put his arm around Pinocchio's shoulder. Listen to me. Anything you need to know, you can learn at the fair. Really? I will write it down on bond and you can take it from me. Yeah, you should take it from him. <laughs> Shut up, you moron. Don't mind him, Pinocchio. Let's go to the fair and you can see for yourself. Then Jiminy said, Pinocchio, he does not know what he is talking about. The fox flicked his finger and tossed Jiminy Cricket away. Pinocchio, don't listen to him. Okay, let's go to the fair. And off they went. No, Pinocchio, stop! But Pinocchio, the fox, and the cat did not hear him. They were already inside the fair. On stage, a puppet show was running in full swing. I am a puppet too. I can dance like that. Pinocchio jumped right onto the stage and started to dance with the other puppets. Suddenly, the crowd started to cheer. Look at that puppet. It has no strings. No strings? Amazing. Everyone laughed and laughed. They threw coins on the stage. A man named Stromboli, who ran the fair, saw coins flying onto the stage. He was a gypsy and a cruel man who was very greedy. <laughs> well now, rubbing his chin, this puppet with no strings will make me rich. The next thing Pinocchio knew, he was picked up and thrown into a cage. Hey, get me out or I will call my papa. He will teach you a lesson. <laughs> you think I'm a fool? Ha <laughs> boy, scream as loud as you want. I'll never let you go. I was waiting for this day to come. Only you can make me the richest person in the world. <laughs> After Stromboli left, Pinocchio shouted for help. No one else but Jiminy Cricket heard Pinocchio's calls. I'm stuck. How did this happen to me? <laughs> this is because you were ignorant to me. Now try not to cry. I'm here with you. We'll find some way out of this. All of a sudden, poof, there was the blue fairy. Please, can you help me? Tell me first, how did you get inside that cage? He decides to lie to the fairy about the incident and then says, Um, I was robbed. Is that right? She said with a frown. Pinocchio's nose began to grow. Yes, robbed by two men. No, four. The nose grew more. They took my books. They made me come here. And they threw me into this cage. His nose grew longer and longer until Pinocchio could see nothing in front of his face but one big giant nose and birds nesting on it. Why is my nose so big? Pinocchio, you must know what the truth really is. I guess so. I wanted to come to the fair. I came here with a fox and a cat. The nose grew shorter and the nest fell off. Then someone put me in this cage. The nose was back to normal. Well done. Now I will get you out of here. With a wave of her wand, Pinocchio was out of the cage. Here are your books. Know this, you are on your own from now on. Make sure you do the right thing next time. After this conversation, the blue fairy vanished. Pinocchio was back on the road to school. A coachman with a beautiful white horse drove up. He had an astonishing buggy, which advertised Pleasure Island on it. Hey, kid, how about a ride? No, thank you. I am going to school. <laughs> He'll ride a lot faster with me. All right. I want to get to school right away. When Pinocchio was inside the coach, the coachman said, Say, kid, why do you think boys like to go to school? To learn things and to grow up, I guess so we can do what we want. 
<laughs> well, what if I told you you could do what you wanted right now? Right now? Yeah, think about it. Skip the books. Skip the school. Right now, how would you like to have all the candy you can eat? All the candy? Yeah, ice cream, candy of every flavor. All this and more at Pleasure Island. Pleasure Island? Best place in the world for boys like you. Don't listen to him, Pinocchio. Why wait? I know just where Pleasure Island is. This is your lucky day, kid. So what do you say? Let's go there. I'm going to Pleasure Island. Uh, here we go again. After a while, the coach stopped. As Pinocchio looked around, he got excited. For everything the coachman had told him was true. Heaps of candy all over. Tubs of ice cream in every flavor. Boys like him could eat and eat and play all day. None of them had to work or clean up. But after a few days, something was odd. So he asked Jiminy Cricket, Where did all the boys go? All I see now are donkeys. I must say there used to be more boys around here. Just then, one of his ears turned into a donkey ear. Then, his other ear popped into a donkey ear, too. Oh, my! What is happening to you? I don't know. Hee-haw! Hee-haw! Oh, no! Now I get it. Boys get turned into donkeys here. Then the donkeys are sold. Pinocchio, we have to get you out of here fast while we still can. Let's go! Hee-haw! Hee-haw! Run! Quick! They ran out of Pleasure Island. Soon, they were at a dock by the ocean. Pinocchio called out to a man by the dock. Please, sir, I'm looking for an old man named Geppetto. Do you know him? Hee-haw, hee-haw. Oh, oh, yes. That's the old man whose son left one morning and never came back. The old man went out on a boat to look for him, and no one has seen the poor fellow since. Oh, no! This is entirely my fault. Hee-haw, hee-haw. <laughs> I must look for my father. I will find you, father. Pinocchio jumped off the dock into the ocean. The cricket jumped in too, close behind. Most of Pinocchio was still made of wood, so he could float on the ocean. Until something was rushing up towards him. Something big and very fast. In a moment, a giant whale was upon them. It opened its giant jaws and with one gulp swallowed Pinocchio. They were in the dark belly of the whale. Are you okay? said Pinocchio to the cricket. I'm fine. Wait a minute, father. Is that you? Father, father, it's me, Pinocchio. Pinocchio? My son! I, I thought I was dreaming. They hugged in joy. Pinocchio was sorry for leaving him alone. And Geppetto was happy to find Pinocchio back. I am so sorry, father. I have realized my mistakes and will never leave you alone again. We must get out of here. I have an idea. Let's make a fire that will get us all out of here. They gathered driftwood, which was mistakenly swallowed by the whale and they got a fire going. This is how we can make the whale sneeze. Pinocchio waved his arms over the flame to make a lot of smoke. Soon, clouds of black smoke were rising up. The whale gave a cough, and then, a shoo! In one big sneeze, Pinocchio, Geppetto, and Jiminy Cricket flew out of the huge whale's hole. Rolling over and over above the seawater at last, they landed on the shore. Then, in a flash, the blue fairy appeared in front of them. Pinocchio, you saved your father. You made the right choices by listening to your conscience and proved that you are both brave and true. And now, you will be a real boy. Blue fairy tapped Pinocchio's head with her wand. Pinocchio looked at his soft arms and soft legs. The blue fairy turned to the cricket and said his work is finished here. In a flash, 
the two of them were gone. And Pinocchio and Geppetto lived happily ever after. The End The Fish Prince Once upon a time, there was a king and queen who had two sons. The older of the two was very short and ugly, with only one eye that resided in the middle of his forehead. His younger brother was tall and handsome and carried himself like a prince. The king played favorites and decided to make his younger, handsome son his heir. My people will never obey a midget with only one eye. This made Disa, the older son, very angry. The kingdom must be mine, or it should have been divided. Matney, the enchantress, who was Disa's wife, determined to get the whole of the kingdom for her husband. She hosted a banquet and invited the younger brother. She then said to her husband, After dinner, you must sit with your brother on the balcony overlooking the river. I will change him into a fish, and then you can throw him into the water. Then we shall be rid of him. Disa agreed to this, and after dinner, invited his brother to sit with him on the balcony. Then Matney threw some powder on the younger prince's head. Just as soon as she did this, the prince was changed into a little fish, and his brother picked him up and tossed him into the river with a laugh of wicked triumph. This all happened so suddenly that the prince hardly knew what happened to him. He flailed all over the place before he struck the river's swift current. When he finally realized that he had been transformed into a fish, he swam very gracefully in the water's depths. He realized that Matney had enchanted him, and he wanted to get as far away from her as he could. So he swam until he was beyond the realm of his father's kingdom. Then, one day, he was caught in a net by some fishermen and taken to the palace of the king of this unknown land to be served up for dinner. He was not a very big fish, and the chef thought it would be much better to keep him as a pet than to cook him. I will take it to the queen's room. She has no children. This little fish may amuse her. The queen was very much pleased with the pretty little fish and became very fond of him. Several days passed, and he grew to be too large for the bowl. So she had another one prepared for him. He is such a dear that he shall be called Neo, the fish prince. After a few days, the fish prince grew so big that the queen had to have a tank made for him, through which the clear water of the river flowed in and out. Then one day, the queen feared that the fish prince was not comfortable in his tank, so she asked him, Are you happy here, Neo? After pondering for a moment, the fish prince replied, I am quite happy here, dear queen mother. But if you could get me a nice wife, I would be happier. It is really quite lonely for me here, all by myself. The answer astonished the queen, but then she did not know that he was a fish only in appearance. Now the queen looked upon the fish prince as her own son, and never imagined that any girl would have the least objection to marrying him. All right, I will find you a wife at once and have a room built in the tank for her. She had the room built at once, but it was not an easy matter to find a wife for the fish prince. Everybody knew that Neo was a pet of the queen's, but beyond that it was pure gossip. The townsfolk even said he was a monster of a fish and that all he wanted a wife for was to eat her. But the queen sent messengers far and wide among the rich and the poor alike, but found no parents who were willing to give their daughter as a wife to the fish prince. 
Then the queen offered a large sum of gold to any father who would send his daughter to be the fish prince's wife. But nothing came of it for a long time. At last, a fakir heard of the large offer of gold and said to the messenger, "You may have my eldest daughter. She can't be much worse off than she, where she is now, and the gold will make me rich." Where is she? She's down by the river washing. She's my first wife's child, and her stepmother makes her do all the hard work, and will not give her enough to eat. She gets more than she deserves, much more than she deserves. You're welcome to take her. We will be glad to be rid of her. And if the fish prince wants to eat her, fine. So the messenger gave the bag of gold to the fakir. And went to the river, where he found a very pretty girl washing clothes on the river's bank. She cried very much when she heard what his duty was, and begged him to let her say goodbye to an old friend before he took her away. Who is this friend? The queen said we're in a hurry. It is a seven-headed cobra, whom I have known ever since I was a little child. Still crying. The girl ran along the bank, and the cobra put his seven heads out of the hole where he lived. I know all about it. Don't cry. Pick up those three pebbles outside my hole and put them in your dress. When you see Neo coming, throw them first at him. If it hits him, he will sink to the bottom of the tank. When he rises to the surface, hit him with a second rock, and the same thing will happen. Throw the third pebble at him, and he will transform from a fish to a prince. He isn't really a fish. He is the son of a king, and is under an enchantment. But you can break the enchantment in the way that I have told you. So Maya dried her tears and went away with the messenger to the palace, where they showed her a beautiful little room that had been prepared for her inside the tank where the fish prince lived. The queen kissed her and said, "You are just the dear little wife I want for my Neo." She let them put her into the little room, where she sat down and waited for a long time with the pebbles in her hand. Then there was a sound of rushing water and of waves dashing against the door. She looked out, and there was a huge fish swimming towards her with his mouth wide open. I want to see my wife. Open this door. Trembling from head to foot with fright, Maya opened the door and threw the first pebble, which went right down his throat. He sunk like a stone, but in a minute or two came up to the surface again. Then Maya threw the second pebble, which hit the fish prince on the head, and he sunk the second time. Maya was so nervous that she nearly missed hitting him with the third pebble. For it only touched the tip of his fin. This time, he did not sink, but changed into a handsome prince. You have broken my enchantment. Now we can enjoy sunshine and happiness in the world above, and need not live in a tank any longer. So, they were drawn up out of the water and taken to the palace, where no one could possibly live happier than Maya and the fish prince. Ever after, the end. The magical frog. An old woman used to live in a village. She had a very beautiful daughter. Her daughter liked cherries so much that she didn't used to eat anything else. Lunch or dinner, she only wanted to eat cherries. In fact, people also started calling her Cherry now. There was a clever woman living in Cherry's neighborhood. Not just clever, 
she was an expert in black magic, too. And in her garden, there were so many cherry trees with a lot of cherries. Cherry used to sneak in the garden because she could not resist and used to take some cherries. Because of this, the witch was very angry. Cherry was very beautiful, too. Her hair was very long and silky. Her face was as bright as the sun. Her features were so beautiful that the witch could hardly hold her anger. One day, as usual, Cherry was collecting cherries in the garden. The witch saw her and could not hold her anger and cast a magic spell on her, which turned her into an ugly frog. Poor Cherry. The king of that village had three sons. The king was also very old and weak. The king said to his sons, I will give you all a task, and he who finishes the task shall be the next king. Your first task? I want a velvet cloth that is so soft it will slip right through my ring. And soon, all three of them went out to find such velvet as soon as possible. The elder two brothers brought so many velvets from the market, but the youngest one was walking and thinking how a normal velvet from the market can pass through Dad's ring. He walked very far, looked in so many places, but could not find anything. He was so tired, so he decided to rest on the bank of the river. Suddenly, one frog jumped out of the river and asked him, Tell me what happened. You seem so tense. She had such a sweet voice. Hearing that, the man said, How can you help me? She insisted. At least tell me why you are worried. The prince told her the story, and after listening to that, she jumped back in the river. She came back with a small piece of cloth and said, Take this cloth, this will help you. Something's better than nothing, the prince thought, and left for the palace. As soon as he was getting close to the palace, the cloth was getting heavier. The king was happy that all three of them had come with velvet cloth. He gave them the ring. When the elder sons tried, only a part of velvet could pass through it, and they failed. Then the youngest son gave the cloth. Everyone was surprised to see such clean and beautiful velvet. That velvet could pass through the king's ring very easily. I finished one task! The prince was very relaxed. The king gave them a new task that he wants a dog as small as he could fit in a walnut shell. Again, all three of them started their hunt. This task was much tougher. Where can you find such a dog? The youngest prince started to walk in the nearest jungle. He walked for so long, and once he was tired, he sat near the same river bank to get some rest. Suddenly, he thought of the frog that had helped him last time. Right then, she jumped out of the river. Oh, my prince, why are you sad again? The prince told her the whole story. Wait, let me try and help you again. And then she jumped in the river again. She came out of the river with a dried fruit in her hand. Take this and break it. Once you reach the palace, you will see the magic. The prince happily left for the palace. The elder brothers found a lot of puppies, but they were of no use. They tried to finish the task, but some of them had big heads, some of them had big feet, and some of them had long tails. Both of them were sad. Now the youngest one broke the dry fruit, and surprise, there was a sweet little puppy sitting inside the shell. The king tried fitting this puppy in a walnut shell, and he could easily fit inside. The prince was very happy. The king was very happy, too. Now it was time for the third and final task. Whosoever will marry the most beautiful girl will be the next king. Great! This was an easy task. The elder son went out to search for a beautiful bride. They knew so many beautiful girls. But the youngest prince was sad. 
Now who will help me? That little frog can't help me. She can't jump in the river and find a beautiful bride. He was lost in his thought, and again, he ended up on the riverbank. The frog again greeted him. Now why are you worried? It seems you're crying a lot. Can you please tell me what happened? And then the prince told her everything. The frog said, Don't worry, head towards the palace. As soon as you are close to the palace, look behind you. But don't laugh, please. The prince was not able to trust the frog this time. He started to head towards the palace. As soon as the palace was close to him, he heard some words from behind. He saw behind him and was totally stunned. Six very big rats were pulling a cart made of pumpkin, and one very big frog was riding the cart. Inside, on a beautiful chair, there was his friend from the river. This was a very weird scene, but the prince didn't laugh at all. What kind of cart is this? What's happening here? I don't understand any of this. And after a short while, he saw a totally different cart. It was being pulled by two beautiful black horses. The person riding the cart was dressed like a soldier. Inside was a very beautiful girl sitting. The prince recognized her in the very first sight, that she was the frog from the river. All three of them entered the palace. Both of the elder sons had a big fleet of beautiful girls. But as soon as Cherry stepped inside the palace, everyone was mesmerized of her, and she was crowned as the Queen of Beauty, because she was the most beautiful of all. So, my little friends, since the youngest prince finished all the tasks, he was announced as the next king. The End Rumpelstiltskin There was once a miller who was poorer than most, but he had a beautiful daughter. The girl was the apple of his eye, and her father boasted that she was lovely enough to be a queen. One day, the king rode by. He noticed the girl by the stream washing linen. How beautiful she is, the king thought to himself. Aloud, he said, What is your name? Before the girl could answer, her father replied, Ha ha ha! If you please, sir, that is my daughter. A more beautiful girl you'll never see. The king looked down at them both with interest. From his beautiful double gray horse. Indeed, she has a lovely face. He replied. The miller's heart swelled with pride. Ha ha ha! To be sure, to be sure! <laughs> But there's more to her than her face, he said. What do you mean, Miller? The king asked curiously. Oh, well, she can, um, I, I mean, uh, well, she can, uh, uh... The miller tried desperately to say something that would impress the king. His eyes met the king's and he looked down at his feet. He watched the chickens scratch around in the yellow straw, looking for grain. Ah, I think uh, she can spin the straw into gold, he exclaimed with the look of immense triumph. But father, his daughter broke in, dismayed at these untrue words. A rare girl indeed, the king said and smiled. If your fingers can really turn straw into gold, then your place is in my castle. Come with me, and I'll see if it is true. The girl had no choice but to obey her king. And together they rode to his castle. When they arrived there, he led her to a high dark room that was filled with straw. A spinning wheel stood in the center. The king said, you will have until sunrise to spin this dry straw into gold. But if you do not, and if your father has lied to me, then you must surely die. 
The girl heard the bolts being drawn across the door, and she was so terrified that she started to cry. Then she noticed a little man standing in front of her. What's the matter? he asked. I'm so unhappy, wept the girl. The king has asked me to spin all this straw into gold by the morning, and I haven't a notion how to do it. What will you give me if I do it for you? The little man asked. The locket around my neck, she replied. The little man took the locket, sat himself down on the wheel, and in no time all the bales of straw was spun into a pile of bobbins full of rich gold thread. As soon as the sun rose, the king came, unbolted the door, and was delighted to see so much gold around him. But his privy purse was still not nearly full. And he needed a lot more gold to pay the soldiers who guarded his land from the greedy neighbors. He took the miller's daughter into another room and told her to spin all the straw into gold by the next morning. That night, the girl began to cry again, for she knew her task was hopeless. But again the little man appeared, and again he said, What will you give me if I spin this straw into gold for you? The belt that's on my waist, she said. The little man took the belt and wore it round and went the spinning wheel again. And bobbin after bobbin was filled with fine gold thread until there was no straw left. The king was pleased beyond measure at the sight. He knew with just a little more gold in his treasury, he could really get the country going again. So he filled his largest room with straw and let the girl into it. If you can spin all this away during the night, he said, I'll take you as my wife, and then you'd need never spin straw again. When the girl was alone, the little man appeared for the third time and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you again? I have nothing left to give you, she replied. Uh, then promise me you'll give me your firstborn child when you're the queen," said the little man. The girl thought a lot of things could happen before that, so she promised him whatever he demanded. When the king came in the next morning, he found heaps of gold where the straw had been. Oh, Miller's daughter, you have spun more gold for me in three nights than I could hope to find in three score years. Your skill is only matched by your great beauty. Will you be my queen? So the girl who already loved him dearly became his wife and in time gave birth to their son. She had quite forgotten her promise to the little man. Until one day, he stepped into the room and said, Now, give me what you promised. The queen was dismayed and begged him to take all her jewels and riches instead. He refused, but then he said, So if you cry so bitterly at the loss of your baby, I'll give you one more chance to save him. You may have three days in which to guess my name, and if you do it then, you may keep him. The queen stayed awake all night, trying to remember all the names she had ever heard. When the little man arrived the following day, she began with Nicholas, Timothy, Harewald, and all the other names she knew. But after each name, he called out, No, no, that's not my name. The next day, she read all the books in the royal library and memorized all the uncommon names in them. She asked, Is your name Nimrod or Noah or Marmaduke? But he always replied calmly, <laughs> That's not my name. The third day, she sent messengers all over the country to learn what names people were calling their children. At length, one messenger came back and said, Your Majesty, I have been unable to find any new names. 
But on a high hill where the foxes and hares bid each other good night, I saw a little man dancing around a fire and singing. All the little things, my royal dame. That Rumpelstiltskin, Rumpelstiltskin is my name. Imagine the queen's delight when she heard that name. But when the little man arrived that night, she asked first, Is your name Roger? No. Is your name Robert? Ha 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 ha, no, no, no. Is it perhaps Rumpelstiltskin? <laughs> the devil it is, the devil it is! He screamed and stamped his foot with such fury that he split in two. The end. <laughs>